Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to the third in our John P. Emily series on entrepreneurship. Um, we're excited tonight to be joined by Ryan Graciano, a Georgia Tech computing alum, um, who is the CTO and co-founder of Credit Karma, um, as well as a face many of you may recognize, our very own Dean Charles Isbell, who's also an alum. For those who don't know me, my name is Jennifer Whitlow, and I'm the Director of Computing Enrollment and Alumni Engagement here in the college. Um, and I have the pleasure of welcoming everyone tonight. So just a few quick logistics before I turn it over to um, our speakers. Um, if you do have questions throughout the conversation, please don't hesitate to put those over in the Q&A um, or in the chat. Either one we will be moder um, monitoring both of those. Um, throughout the discussion um, and feel free to use the chat to talk with each other. Um, we've got quite a few current students and alumni joining us this evening. Um, so please feel free to use the chat um, to, to chat with each other. Um, we'll be recording tonight's um, talk as well um, and we'll make the recording available usually about a week to two weeks after um, the event in case you want to share it with other alumni or friends. So, with all of that said, I'm going to turn it over to Dean Isbell. Thank you, Jen. So, uh, let me also join uh, join Jen in uh, welcoming you to this, um, the third in our series on entrepreneurship, and to, to welcome Ryan. So, um, normally in this sort of situation, I would give a long, rambling introduction and tell you everything that I, I know about Ryan, at least everything that he wants you to know uh, that I know about him. Uh, but this is supposed to be a conversation. So our goal here tonight, here tonight is to, to talk to one another. I have a couple of questions that I already have uh, lined up uh, to get things started, but we're hoping that you'll be able to, and you will, ask whatever questions you want to ask. Again, as Jen said, using, a, using it in the, the Q&A, uh, and we will be able to um, I will look for those and I will uh, try to intersperse those with some of the questions that I have. And this will go almost, but not quite as long as you want it to go. So we're going to, we're going to talk all the way through about uh, eight o'clock Eastern time. Uh, and again, we want this to be a conversation. So Ryan, instead of introducing you, I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself. So you've got a few minutes. What do you want everybody here listening in to know about you and your journey? Sure. So uh, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. It's, uh, I would love to be there in person someday. I'm hoping that that will be will be possible again once we're all vaccinated and I can fly. Uh, but yeah, a little bit about me. So uh, I'm a CTO and co-founder at Credit Karma. I joined in 2007. Uh, I was a CS grad, so Georgia Tech 2004. I was actually in and out in four years, which I don't know if that's more common nowadays, but seemed to be not very common back then. Uh, I was... Uh, paying my own way through scholarships and loans. And so I was financially motivated to make sure that I could exit on time. Uh, I today run uh, a good chunk of, tech, of Credit Karma. So I have technology, security, uh, our core product, which is product and design for the apps that um, you might use at home. And if you're familiar with Credit Karma, or if you're not familiar with Credit Karma, we have a little over 100 million consumers and we're uh, a leader in credit and financial services in, in the US. And so we um, basically can give you everything from your credit score to your home value, your auto, value, your auto value. We have checking and savings accounts, and we do a little bit of everything. Uh, and so, yeah, I'm happy to happy to be here and ask me whatever. Excellent. Well, I, I think I will, and I hope our audience will too. Um, so, by the way, it is uh, a little more usual to get out in, in uh, four years or so, but certainly uh, when you were here, that was unusual. When I was here, which was several hundred years ago, it almost never happened. I did get out in four years, but it took a lot to do. So uh, you told us a little bit about yourself, but really told us a little bit about uh, your company, where you are. I want to ask you a little bit about kind of how you got here and the, the sort of decisions you made and, and how you became the entrepreneurial force that you are. So uh, I am told, um, tell me if this is true, uh, that you originally wanted to be a comedy writer. And then I guess you discovered the internet sometime in the 2000s and uh, went on to work for IBM before doing uh, before doing Credit Karma. Could you tell us just a little bit about why you wanted to be a comedy writer and then what drove you to do instead what you're doing? Unless this is is what you're doing, this is a big comedy. Bit. <laughs> it is true. This is kind of like the midlife crisis question. You know, now that I'm nearing 40, can you reflect on all the choices that you've made and the past not taken? 
but I was, uh, I was, I did want to be a comedy writer. I was very into the, the creative work, arts and language arts, and I thought that I was going to pursue a career in creative writing, and I loved comedy writing. And then in the mid '90s, uh, you know, I, I think we got AOL first, and then uh, it was uh, a short hop from there to using Gopher and discovering the World Wide Web and IRC and this rabbit hole of internet technologies. And I started to quickly become enamored with the idea that you could create something and reach so many people at once. And so that really captured my attention and drove me in a completely different direction and caused me to apply to uh, to Georgia Tech. Although at the time, the, the press was not very kind to people going into computer science. And it was right around uh, 1999 that I was applying, 2000. You know, if you remember that time, it was all the dot-com bubble burst press. All technology jobs are going to be offshored. This is a dead-end career. That was like the kind of stuff that I was reading. And so I really went into computing thinking this wasn't going to be a great career choice, but it would be something that I was passionate about. Uh, and so that that's what how I ended up there. There was, a, there was sort of a side benefit and that ironically, I didn't really love talking to people or having a lot of interpersonal connection. I thought that my career was going to be hanging out in front of a computer, typing, and creative writing and coding or have a lot in common in that you're just like deep in this thing. You're producing something, it's just you and the and the machine, and things could not have turned out more differently. Wow. Uh, so yeah, it's been a it's been a long road, uh, an interesting one. So how is it? How is it? Uh, how are they the same, and how is it different? You said that you know you you that this was uh, it turned out very differently. So what does it mean? Like in a in a particular day, what are you doing that's different from what you're expecting it to be? Yeah, nowadays my job is so different from how I initially uh, imagined it. And I'll tell a story. So when I was at IBM, so I, when I graduated from Georgia Tech, I, I joined this super small company uh, called Benetica, and it was 60 people. And we were immediately acquired by IBM, this gigantic 130,000 at the time company. And uh, I, I made a name there pretty quickly through some you know, internal accomplishments. And I, and I was put on this team, and the manager on this team tells me, you know, if you just join this team, I won't give you any goals. There won't be any performance evaluations. You can literally do whatever you want. He's like, I won't even pay attention to when you're in the office or not. Just do whatever you want and, you know, kind of make a name for our group. And I thought this was the coolest job that anyone could ever have. No pressure, no goals, just sort of like spin off and, and figure stuff out. And what I discovered quickly is that I just... I just hated it. You know, I really hated it because the the lack of pressure and that that lack of kind of external um, social validation, you know, that that's I found that to be very tough. And I started to realize also, you know, what got me into a lot of this was that kind of I love the idea of reaching people and the networking aspect of commuting of computing. And once you take that away, I actually was like, oh, I I, I realize that my passion is elsewhere. And so. You know, I, I I made this big career shift, went to Credit Karma, where I thought that I would have this super high pressure job, reaching a lot of consumers, um, more managerial role, so like take on a leadership position. And today, my life, you know, I have around eight or eight hundred something people in my group, and my whole day is is talking to people and doing things like this and rallying people in a group behind a strategy and. Uh, it's all communication, essentially, and, and very little of that, like kind of one to one, you know, typing, writing code and or, or, or working on a creative draft. And what I've discovered is I, I actually really enjoy that uh, a lot more than I ever thought that I possibly could. Uh, and it's funny how life kind of takes you in that direction, because if you'd asked me when I was, uh, you know, 22, graduating, would I be doing things like this? And would I enjoy things like this? I would have, I would have said, you're, why are you even asking me? <laughs> do, you, do you know me? You're, you're completely off base. I could never do anything like that. So I like that. So, you know, so, so I guess there's a, there's a lesson there about how you end up doing things very different from what you're doing. I, I've kind of always 
wanted to be a professor, always wanted to do computer science before I knew what that was, either computer science or being a professor. But what I thought it was and what it turned out I really wanted to do was, was sort of very different and, and driven by events. So you mentioned something uh, early, early, on, earlier, a little bit earlier that I, I, I want to touch on for a bit about when you became a computer scientist, right? So uh, right now we're in the middle of the pandemic. It's why we're doing it this way and why we aren't spending our, our, our time fa face to face. Um, and that's made things, I think, interesting for many of our students and many of our alumni. And I think a, a lot of them are really worried about what does it mean to kind of navigate uh, their careers, maybe create, start companies or, or what is sort of the right thing to do here. So you started in the dot-com bubble and you went on the co-found credit com. What have you learned through this experience of starting your career doing uh, the dot-com bubble, starting uh, uh, Credit Karma just before, if I got the timing right, just before the 2008 or just around the 2008 crash. Uh, you're doing all of these things and always at a time when it seems like the world is not ready or not interested in what is you're doing. Uh, what have you learned from that? Has it been better, worse than you expected? Yeah, I think it's good to see a couple of cycles because it's very easy, I think, when you, especially right when you step out of school to think the world will always be the way it is. And you sort of, we all have this normalcy bias, right? You know, sort of the way things are is, is the way things that are, that things are going to be. And you see this invest in investment very much. Um, people invest very differently in the downtimes and in the uptimes. And so, yeah, since, since 2000, uh, 2004, I have a much longer view on how things are going to turn out. And karma started a really interesting time. So we started in 2007, which is like the height of the, peak, the last peak prior to the Great Recession, and everything blew up in 2008. And so we were, we were thinking, oh, we have this great idea. It's going to get all this traction. We're going to go fundraise. We'll rake in these, you know, the crazy, kind of crazy valuations that people are handing out at that moment in time. And then six months later, that's all gone. You know, we pitched 40-something VCs and got no term sheets. We eventually had one. And it was grossly undervaluing what we had because they knew that there was just no money out there. And so when you have to live through a scenario like that, I think it teaches a sort of uh, kind of grit and determination. And so, you know, I've seen companies start at both at the height and at the, at the, in the depths. And, you know, what I have noticed is that the, the ones who, the founders who've done both, I think are the smartest about take as much money as you can while you can, but then don't spend it. Hang, hang on to it because they know that the, you know, the, the depths are coming. The recession always comes. And then once you're there, you want to be the company that's in position to hang on to what you've already raised at a, at a, at a great price. And so we, we developed that discipline really out of necessity. You know, it was, you know, it was our survival. And I, going through that, I think, gives you a lot of perspective on, you know, how to how to start companies and, and how to weather, you know, for the future. So is that what's happening now? I mean, we're in the middle of another economic downturn. I mean, it's not it's differently visible than it was in, in 2008, 2009. But, you know, it's another kind of great recession. Uh, is this one different or is it the same? Are you just seeing history repeat itself? I do think it's I think this one is a little bit different in that. It's actually, things are actually kind of up. The market's actually pretty crazy right now. Valuations are, are sort of nuts. There's way too much money out there. People have not stopped investing. Uh, GameSpot aside, that, that whole thing <laughs> I'm reading about today. Uh, but yeah, there's, there's plenty of money out there right now, which is, and, and you know, there's a whole kind of different like ethics and societal thing on like the amount of money that's floating around for these investments versus the amount of money that, you know, the average consumer actually has to spend and, you know, kind of what that means long term for our society. But in terms of starting a company, it's actually this actually feels like a pretty good time. Because there's so much capital floating, the valuations are so crazy um, and everybody knows that it can't last. You know, this feels much more to me like 2007 than it feels like 2008. It feels like we're on the upswing um, and waiting for the downswing. Huh. So, so that's interesting. So, so this actually brings me to one of the questions in the, the Q and A. And I, so, I think it's a perfect time to bring it up. So, I'm going to do it. So, so here's the question, and 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 I'm going to put a little bit of a spin on it. But, but here's the question: um, Do you believe those three years after you graduated 
and before Credit Karma was found, uh, were essential for you to come up with the idea, getting used to the industry, and so on. And, and the reason I want to ask that question now uh, from the from the audience is, um, if now is the time, or now feels like a great time to start something, and let's say that's going to be true for at least a few more months, maybe another year, we have people sitting out in the audience who are thinking of doing that, but maybe haven't had that experience at IBM for a few years or haven't been able to live in the industry. Should they wait? Should they go out there and get that experience, understand what's going on before trying to start something uh, brand new, or should they go out now? No, I, I would go out now. If you, if you had an idea and you're passionate about it, I don't think that those three years were that valuable to what you know, I eventually ended up doing. Definitely I learned things and there, there was value there, but I certainly think that if I came out of school and I had I met our co-founders and we had that idea and I went for it, you know, that I could have figured it out in the same way that we figured it out. And there wasn't much in the way of like market or industry knowledge that I really picked up because I was in a totally different sector than what I, you know, what Credit Karma ended up being. You know, the only similarities were that I was working on a software team and that it tended to be, you know, more um, secure and scalable software and, you know, learning to kind of work in a professional environment and all that kind of stuff. But um, you can you can pick those things up relatively quickly. And certainly you can work with people who who know them and, and can help teach you. And, you know, yeah, I mean, if those if, if that's the question, like, hey, should I wait? Um, I would say no, don't wait. Um, it's much harder to start things in the downturn. If you think that the timing is good, go for it. So, you know, it's sort of implicit in what you're saying is that there's skills that you kind of, I mean, I think we believe, so tell me if you don't believe what I'm about to say. There are skills that are useful, right? There are things you learn, there are things you do, and you can do things well and you can do things poorly. Um, maybe some of that's luck, maybe some of it is just really sort of working it out. Um, but I guess I'm kind of curious, where you think you picked up those skills? Was it really on the job as you were building the company, surrounded by people? Did you lean on others for advice? Is it stuff you got because uh, you saw someone at an entrepreneur series uh, talk about their own experiences? Was it, what, what was it that got you uh, whatever it is you needed, whatever skills you needed and experiences you needed to be able to, to take the company where you've been able to take it? I, I did get actually some tidbits from, uh, from these kinds of forums. I, I remember uh, early on, I heard uh, Diane Green, who was uh, head of VMware, you know, she founded and was CEO of VMware sometime, and then she went on to run uh, Google Cloud, and we, we actually met uh, later because we're, we're big Google Cloud customers. But actually, something that she's headed a forum once resonated with me, how she was um, trying to accomplish something internally. She was trying to get VMware on a big stage back when nobody knew you know what it was and she was you know she kept hiring salespeople that said oh that's impossible we can never get there and then she finally realized she just had to find the right person the person who wouldn't take no for an answer and that she had to be a lot more decisive and with her HR moves and you know I learned from that and I learned from investors you know one of the best pieces of advice I had from an investor when we were scaling the company and I was saying like you know I have so many leadership positions to recruit for it takes so much time. I was spending uh, in some years, like upwards of 80% of my time just recruiting and, and team building. And they were like, you know, the best way to look at it is look at your job. What are the parts of your job you really don't enjoy doing and get passion from? And you need to hire there first because that's going to keep you going to take these things off your plate and focus your energy elsewhere. That will come naturally to you. Um, and so that was helpful. And so it was a lot of, there's a lot of little interactions like that. And um, one of the, and I can't even remember where I heard this, but one of the, the, the things I've always tried to do my whole career is make myself redundant. So try to hire people who are better than you in every domain. And if you're just constantly focusing on, you know, hey, can I take a vacation and nothing falls apart? I mean, it sort of leads naturally to hiring more experienced people. And when you hire more experienced people, you learn from them. You don't have to have all the answers um, because nobody has all the answers. No leader I've worked for or with. Um, but what I think the best leaders that I've worked with have done is they always have brilliant people working with. Uh, and they, they bring those people along everywhere they go. 
And, you know, that I think that is not something that I appreciated in school because I was thinking that you know, I was very focused on how to do things, you know, making the best decisions and learning the most. But what I probably underappreciated is just really how much time you need to spend on bringing, making the right connections with the right people, nurturing those, and then making sure that you're bringing those people along, you know, that, that you have those people's backs. Because that, you know, that comes back to you. So you, you, I, I, I hear exactly what you're saying. It's, it's been sort of similar in my life. Someone said something that's really stuck with me that's helped me that's similar to what you said, which is that, you know, you can only really learn from mistakes. And the secret is they don't have to be your mistakes. So <laughs> you're always learning from others and what they've done. Um, and if you do that, uh, then you do well. And, and I, I, I think I appreciate that. I think it's something that, that we should all we should all sort of remember. So I'm going to do a. Um, uh, 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 take another question from the audience. There's a, a bunch here. Um, there's two I'm fighting between which to pick. So I, I guess I'll just pick both of them in a row. So here's the first one. So um, since you view, well, because you because you view development as a creative exercise, does that change how you find or develop talent? You just uh, talked a little bit about finding the, the right kinds of people. So do you look for the stereotypical, the stereotypical Google, Facebook interviews that just filter out folks who can't memorize math tricks? That's a very loaded view of, of those interviews uh, or do you try to talk to people about projects what they build perspectives passions what do you do to figure out that the people you're interviewing are the kind of person creative I suppose person you want? yeah I'm not a big leap code fan you know if you know the if you're referencing Google Facebook interviews I'm sure you're familiar with the code and the, the math tricks uh, I, I don't love that approach although we have found that just very basic kind of coding screens, like can you reverse a string? Can you write, uh, you know, a loop that does X? Simple stuff can filter out a certain number of people right off the bat. You know, I I don't usually go as far as uh, some of the leak code stuff, but um, I do think some amount of on-the-job skill, uh, skill proving is is important. Behavioral stuff, I think, is much more valuable. So what I did in the early days when I was, personally recruiting everybody before we had a recruiting team is I would look on every resume and I would try to single out side projects, roles where I thought that this person was uh, pivotal or, or in kind of an architectural position. And then I would really hone in on that in the interview. So, you know, tell me about how you decided to use these technologies. What were the trade-offs? What did you, what did you not do? What are, tell me about three decisions, you know, where you, um, you know, made the wrong, you know, the wrong choice. Th those kinds of things where people can actually explain to you their thought process. And that often leads you down a whole interesting conversation path on, you know, how they tried this and they tried that. And you know, now you're gonna get a feeling for how they actually solve things on the job versus just kind of like crank out algorithms. And, you know, let's be honest, most people aren't writing very complicated algorithms these days. They're, you know, they're downloading whatever JavaScript library will do it for them. and you know, that's that's doing a lot of that stuff. A lot of the the work in computing today is actually putting these pieces together in a really intelligent way and thinking through the systems and, and making the people work. Hmm, fair enough. So let me ask you the other question. Um, so um, you said uh, that you hated the job that you, you started out with because there wasn't any pressure. Um, and actually, I want to ask you something else about that. I, I, let me try to remember that. But let me ask you this question first. You said you hated the job uh, that you started out with because there wasn't any pressure. So then how do you now put yourself in um, pressure situations uh, if there's no external pressure on you? I mean, I guess there is some external pressure on you because there's the market and, uh, so that, you know, what yeah. you create this world where you get whatever it is that motivates you and drive you. What, how do you do that now, given the position you're in? Yeah, I, there's no lack for external pressure now. You know, now we have revenue targets and uh, many external market pressures. And there's, uh, you know, this whole little, this whole last year <laughs> that we've had. Uh, so, yeah, I don't I don't have to worry about that anymore. But uh, I think this is different for everybody. You know, sometimes I just find a lot of passion in learning something or doing something. And so, you know, I'll get really into dog training. You know, that was a thing that I did one year. Another year was weightlifting and, you know, so I'll find these kind of internally motivated things. But what what 
for me has been true is those things don't tend to last that that drive to do those things you know it it fizzles out once i kind of feel like i've reached a certain point and then i'll keep doing the weightlifting or whatever and the dog training but just not at the same you know kind of intensity and what's so what i've you know just for my own personal experience what i've found helpful is i need some kind of externality you know if i want to keep weightlifting to the same extent i need to actually have this i have a spreadsheet with a friend and we both put in there what we're doing and so we can catch each other on the weekend and say, hey, I noticed you didn't do the thing. Why didn't you do the thing? And that that helps a lot. And I think that's why, you know, things like Peloton, you know, are so are so successful because that external social pressure really helps. I really admire people who don't need that and who can, you know, kind of work on their own research and, you know, in a very self-directed fashion. Um, that has not been me. <laughs> I found that that's not me. So, so, so you're describing it as external pressure. Another person might describe it as you're just basically a competitive person and you need someone you have to be beating at any given time. Is that it or is it something else? Um, I, I do think there's a competitive aspect, although, um, you know, I don't think that's just it. I've, I, what I have said is, you know, I do like to, I would like to win. So I want to, you know, I want to meet our metrics. I want to make sure that my spreadsheet's filled out so I can get my high fives for my friends. Um, but I, you know, I think uh, when people say competitive, the thing that can come to mind is that people take losing in a very hard way. Um, and that I've, that is not true about me. So I, I tend to not react that way. I, I just sort of tend to dig in. Um, and so, yeah, there's, I think a competitive element there. And maybe I'm a, a conflating with, with with the social aspect. Um, but it's not necessarily about beating others, if that makes sense. It's just more about just winning. No, I, I, I totally get it. All right, I'm going to ask you, uh, I'm going to ask you, uh, cause we, we're moving in a nice, a, a nice direction. I'm going to ask you one of the questions that I, I had prepared before. And before I do that, I want to ask you a, um, what, what maybe is a, a, an easy question. Uh, what's the story behind Credit Karma's name? <laughs> well, I, if you will recall back to the mid 2000s, you might remember these commercials for freecreditreport.com. Yep. And some of those were very catchy names, very strong domain authority. And what at the time we realized is uh, one, we just don't have the capital to compete with these companies. And two, even if we did, their domain affinity so greatly outstrips our own that it will just be very challenging to come in with a name that didn't have credit in it at all. Hmm. And so we, there was a very tactical decision there that we wanted to make sure that we could have credit in the name, but then we wanted to, we wanted to be bigger than credit. You know, we wanted to go beyond and that was, the, and so the concept of, of karma was that, you know, Hey, the credit system should work for you and it's going to work for you in all these other ways. You know, we had this big vision for, you know, how we're going to expand more broadly into into finance. And so the combination of the two is what we landed on. And the alliteration is, is nice. Yeah, it's the alliteration <laughs> that I like. I, I, I'm with you. All right, so let me ask you a question about leadership, because this is this has really been, I think, a, a kind of strain uh, in a lot of your answers. You're really talking about what does it mean to be a leader? What does it mean to, to sort of develop a leadership, a leadership skills? It's what you do. So, uh Let's just take the obvious statement. Effective leadership is key for the success of an organization. I, I assume that you believe that. I think I, I certainly believe. That. So I'm curious, as you sort of think about your journey, um, where you were and where you are now, what were the assumptions that you made about what it took to be an effective leader when you first started Credit Karma? And how do you feel about that now? Do you think that those the things you went in with were right or were they wrong or have they sort of become more subtle or nuanced? Like how how things change this way? And what would you tell someone now who, you know, not doesn't just want to start a company or doesn't just want to um, go off and, and be a part of a, a large organization, but wants to eventually be a leader in that organization or in that company? <laughs> I honestly just had no clue what it took to be a leader. That is that would be my. My quick answer, I had no idea at all. I thought being a leader would be more about having all these brilliant ideas and making all the right decisions and, you know, kind of steering the company in the right direction. And, you know, not that those things aren't, you know, aren't good things to do, but, you know, what 
I learned much more is a lot of it is, you know, painting a vision that motivates people and gets people excited and then recognizing the people who are really contributing the most, being able to recruit, recognize, motivate, and bring people along and, you know, create, you know, a team culture is really what leadership is. And that, that was not at all what, you know, it sounds obvious, but that was not at all, you know, where my head was when I was starting the company. My head was very much in, you know, we got to pick the right things to do and make the right decisions and, and kind of win on every product feature. Um, but, you know, luckily, you know, some of the, the positives of starting in a downturn is you grow fairly slowly. And so I actually had a couple of years to figure it out, sort of muddle my way through the mistakes and start to learn like, hey, it's, it's actually just about attracting the best people and getting them excited to, to work here and, you know, solving conflicts in a productive, constructive way, you know, making sure that there's no, you know, kind of ill effects of like passive aggressive nature and, you know, those types of things, you know, poor handling of conflict can kind of become a weed in your organization that is, is hard to uproot. And so just all of those little, you know, kind of aspects were, you know, I just had no idea that, that was what I was in for. <laughs> By the way, I totally agree with you on the, the managing conflicts thing. I feel like that's what I spend an enormous amount of my time, time doing. So let's talk a little bit about those roles. There are a couple of questions coming in. I want to get to them, but, but you, you, you piqued my interest on this, so I, I want to ask you this question right away. So um, what are the roles you actually play in, your, in your, your current organization? And I mean that both as the kind of, you know, titles, job duty sense, but also in the kind of, you know, I'm the person who has to bring people together and manage conflict. So the actual question is, you know, as co-founder and CTO, you wear two hats in the organization. Can you tell us a little bit more about these two roles, how they drive the decisions you make, do they come in tension ever, and, um, you know, how do you think about the short term and the long term, but also what does it mean to play these different roles and what other roles do you play? Yeah, so the the quick org chart is, yeah, I have product design, technology, which is essentially all of engineering, security, analytics, um, and data science and, and machine learning, kind of like all of my umbrella. And so it is, um, it's conceivably a lot of hats, and, you know, you could kind of drill in on, on one or, or another. But, the, you know, some early, we were talking earlier about, like, advice you got in earlier in your career that shaped how you how you manage and some of the early advice I, I got from uh, an investor was to um, try to focus on only the things that only you can do so try to carve out a space you know hey in this in this space are there jobs that only you in this role can do and that's where you should be spending the majority of your time and so if you're kind of finding yourself very tactically involved in any one of those other organizations and then you realize that a leader in that organization could just as effectively, if not more effectively, be handling that. You should be recognizing that you're not really doing your job. So my 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 first priority is to think about okay, across these different things, um, how well are they operating? You know, so it's often the intersection points where we have the most challenge, and actually shaping the whole system is really my job. That's the that's the thing that only I can do. So making sure that the organizations are structured in a way to fulfill not only our current goals, but our future goals are a lot of my, uh, my job and setting strategy and all that kind of stuff also tends to, you know, to flow up to me. Um, but especially as you're growing your company, it can be very, very easy to get too dug into the day to day and especially the things that you're good at. And you'll you'll realize that you're avoiding the job that you actually should be doing. I feel so seen. Um, so how does that how does that advice uh, square with something you said earlier about trying to make yourself redundant? If your 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 goal is to find the thing that only you can do, but you're also trying to make yourself redundant, what does that mean? What does that force you to do in order to keep growing? Yeah, I think it kind of dovetails from the last question. It's like you know if. If you're always trying to make yourself redundant, you know, what you're really trying to do is, you know, you're looking at your day and you're saying, you know, what are all the things that I'm, that I am, that I'm in? What are the meetings that I'm in? What decisions do I have to make? And does it make sense for me to be making these decisions? You know, how, how could I, how could I empower a leader underneath me to be making those decisions? Because the more you're, you are kind of considering yourself to be redundant, the more you're forcing yourself to come to terms with, 
how self-sufficient are the organizations that I'm creating really? You know, can my technology and my security organization actually solve conflicts between each other? You know, are they actually healthy organizations or does everything have to come to me? You know, that it if you look at it in that way, um, you will realize that, you know, one, it's it's actually kind of impossible to make yourself redundant. There's always there's always more stuff. <laughs> it's not it's not a there's no answer to that. But there, you'll you'll give yourself a pretty good view of where your organization is weak and where you're actually just kind of filling in gaps that you shouldn't be filling in. Hmm. So then let, let me ask you, let me, let's, let's drop down a level of detail there, there and I'm take, taking a question from, um, from the audience here. Uh, how do you schedule your tasks day to day then? Like, how do you do that? At, you know, what, what's one level deeper detail from, from what you're describing and, you know, how do you avoid the temptation of boiling the ocean? How do you really find your upper bound? How do you keep yourself sort of balanced in doing this? This this job of of finding out the gaps you should be filling and the gaps you shouldn't be filling. Yeah, I have I have a strategy for this. I so I think about it and you know there's a couple different kind of pillars to how I I think about scheduling. One being there's a certain amount of information gathering you just need to be doing all the time, and mm -hmm. a lot of the best information gathering you'll get is in one on one meetings, uh, and especially over time, you know, you can't just do like one off one on one meetings. You need to have them over a long period of time because you need to establish enough of a relationship that people will actually tell you stuff. Because if you just meet someone once a year, you're going to get the, you know, ah, everything's great. I wish this thing was a little bit better, but everything's great. And, you know, that's not the conversation that you really want. You want the, you know, what is actually going on? What are the what are the issues that need to be solved and, you know, what's good and what's not good? So anyway, so I structure um, a series of one on ones specifically in the areas of the organization that I think that, you know, I really want to be gathering info on. And I will amp those up in areas where I think that I just don't know enough. Um, or I think that, you know, maybe uh, I could be making um, improvements. Then I think about like, okay, functionally, you know, do I generally know what's going on, what the strategies are, all that kind of stuff. So I structure another series of, you know, functional reviews and kind of like upward reporting type things. And then I try to create space for strategy. So, you know, every different companies do this differently. Some will have kind of like an annual and then a quarterly refresh or biannual or they'll do like a monthly whatever. Um, it kind of doesn't matter. I think you can do it, you know, however you want. But, you know, making sure that you actually have thought through how your one and three and five year planning are going to work in advance. So there's plenty of space for that. And then from there, you know, you'll have like some remainder in your calendar that will quickly get sucked up by, you know, everything else. But, you know, my strategy is first set the things that kind of have to happen top down and then let the kind of like everything else stuff come in. If you lead from just, OK, my calendar is this and how do I fit these other things in? You know, that tends to be, you know, it, it doesn't work out. And I've coached some people through doing this before and, you know, they'll often say, you know, oh, I just can't, you know, I can't take a day off. I'm like, well, can you really not, like, take take tomorrow off. Just blow it off and cancel your calendar and then tell me the next day how much stuff really got blown up and dropped. And, you know, usually people, you know, discover like, okay, I actually do have more space than I thought I had. And there's room for me to figure this out. Um, but you have to unmoor yourself a little bit from, you know, the current day to day, I think, to do it. So, uh, actually, does your assistant read your email? That's I've, a question. Tried, <laughs> I've tried that a couple of times, and yeah, I, not not currently, no, not currently. Uh, I I just I haven't found it all that much more efficient to do that. Okay. I know some people who do that, but I don't. I don't currently. I'm currently trying it. Um, so, <laughs> although, and it, it's it's better than it was. I can I can tell you that much. So, so I want to ask you one more question on this, and I'm going to sort of switch topics on sort of your view about technology. Uh, but a couple of people are asking for kind of uh, examples of the process you're just describing. Uh, so let me let me take one of these questions um, and and just dive a little bit into it. Not not a long answer, but just a just a just a, a few a little bit more meat on the bone. So then, in the sort of spirit of what you what you've just been describing. Um, What's like a what's like the big hard challenging task or problem that you encountered at, at Credit Karma 
that you really you really had to overcome and you really had to change the way you were doing things in order to, to kind of make it work or that you had to do all the kinds of stuff that you're you're talking about to, to to figure out how to how to move past it but that you had to be a part of or you had to really empower other people to do in some way yeah there have been many i mean a couple of examples would be you know organizations that have moved over to me and so you know they've usually moved over to me because there's something that we're trying to change and you know one uh, such organization was our analytics organization and you know at the time those years ago um our, our analytics org they knew the most but they had the least executive communication mm. and they had a lot of cultural issues internally you know feeling unheard and and you know i i had to really try to dive in and understand well, what why is this you know why why is it that the folks who know the most talk the least and what is it about how we've structured the company that that has made this the case and how much of that is cultural and and so you know at the time what i did was um you know the first thing that happens when i move them is i structure you know a series of meetings one-on-ones and i have them a lot so with all of the new direct reports i picked up which i think was three or four you know we meet every day which is a lot of time by the way to be you know you're spending like an hour or two a day on this thing um but you will you know just by diving in the deep end like that you just quickly start to really understand what's going on and i would attend meetings and operational things just to kind of sample and see how things were going and i spent a lot of time talking to folks across the organization hey you know why don't you talk to the analytics or you know i see that you got this information from a product manager why did you do that um and once you can have you know 10, 100 of these conversations, you start to triangulate on what some issues are and some solutions. And uh, what I've found is, you know, after doing this with organization after organization, is you start to see some patterns in how things are structured and how people communicate. And that can lead to some common, you know, kind of common solutions. And so for the analytics org, you know, we restructured it. Um, we gave them a kind of a different way of, of of operating their org to create more standardization so that it was clear that when something came out of the analytics org, it was more trustworthy than something you would get from another source, which required some technology changes and some other stuff. And then uh, I worked a lot with our executive team to restructure a lot of our executive meetings to bring analytics front and center and to give them a, you know, kind of a space. Um, but it's, you know, it's different for, for everything. And I, I think that the, just the first thing I would say is just you, you just really have to dive in and understand it as best as you can. You know, if you're trying to really, you know, change something, you know, talk to all the leaders, talk to all the people around and try to get a feeling for, you know, what what's happening. So so I'm going to I'm going to riff off a question, ask a different version of this, but riff off a question from, from the audience then, um, given what you just said. So. It sounds, it may, so I don't know how many people in our audience are alum, um, how many of them are current students. I don't know how many of them are computer scientists or computational media majors or in the machine learning. I don't, I don't know what they do, but let's assume that a lot of them have a very strong technical background or are trying to have a very strong technical background now and they're in the middle of it. The way we've been talking about this, uh, one might infer that about 107% of your current job is managing people, right? So do you ever, feel as if you kind of lost uh, whatever sort of technically interesting thing got you in the CS in the first place or got you thinking about your first job in the first place? And how important was it, even if you spend most of your time managing people as it were, how important was the kind of technical background um, or way of thinking or whatever it is uh, that you sort of experienced going through school and doing the things you did? How important has that been in, um, in, in informing what you do now? Well, you know, I one thing that we've discovered over the course of our you know choosing leaders and managers and our teams is that i tried having people with no engineering experience or little like project management experience managing engineers and it never worked well it never works and we had issues with the manager sometimes just not really knowing how to interface with the folks on his team or her team, uh, we've had issues with the people on the team just feeling like, well, you know, my manager just doesn't really understand what I do, so I don't know how my career is ever going to progress here because no one is really looking out for the work. And 
we, I actually eventually just said, look, this is not, not viable. This is not a viable way to go. We're always going to have en people with engineering backgrounds managing engineers. And uh, at some point, you know, whatever, they all roll up to me and, you know, I'll, I'll roll up to our CEO who doesn't have engineering experience. So at some point that, you know, the buck stops somewhere. But um, I've found it to be necessary that you have some. And I've mine is very, very important, you know, just to be able to understand what's going on. Your background is critical. It really is. And I try to stay up to date. You know, I, I tinker around. I, I'm on Hacker News all the time. You know, I just, I read about what's, what's out there and I'll download it, install it, and mess around. And it, you know, it's not that important for my day-to-day -day job, but it's actually surprising how useful it is just to kind of get a mental model for what people are doing every day. No, I, I, I like that a lot. And I, I, I find that that's true. Um, and in fact, this kind of way of thinking and just being able to sort of speak the same language and recognize what people, how people are modeling and seeing the world is actually very crucial to, to managing them and to working with them. So, in fact, I wouldn't even want to say managing them. I would, I would say working with them. Kind of legal. So let's, let's speak of technology. Let's, let's, let's uh, change to a technology question because, of course, at 7.12, I was wondering how we were going to fill up an hour and it's already, we only have nine minutes left. Um, so I want to get through at least a couple more questions from, from the audience before we, before we wrap it up. So um, here's a, a question about sort of your view of, 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 um, uh, of the way things are going around technology. So here's the question. As moving forward uh, in technological innovation, do you see technology being or becoming increasingly decentralized? Um, and then there's a, there's a reference to blockchain, um, which I, I just refuse to, to say blockchain more than two times in a day, so I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm up for my quota. But do you see this kind of decentralization happening or do you see a kind of centralization happening? What does that mean? And what does it mean for, for companies like yours? Yeah, I guess it depends on what the, what you mean by decentralized exactly. What I think is, you know, kind of the story of computing is that we've moved up layers of abstraction and we will continue doing that. And so, you know, when I, when we were starting Karma, you know, I had physical infrastructure. And I was just trying to virtualize it. And now, you know, now you're on AWS and you're using whatever service they offer that does the specific thing that you want. Now I'm on Google Cloud. I don't know how many machines I use behind BigQuery, but it does a fabulous job. And I don't want to know. And so the, you know, I, I think that's what, what's happening is we'll see more and more of that abstraction and the, Bigger companies like ours that previously weren't really able to make use of those things because of their scale and the economics and just the customizability and all these other things, um, the those those solutions are just going to become increasingly sophisticated, and those barriers are going to going to fall away. And uh, I think you're already seeing this. You know, I, I don't. What was the blockchain angle? I'm curious about that. <laughs> it's a uh... It's not that it was a bad question. I just had this thing about saying blockchain. So you made me say it three times. Uh, the question was, and applications made with blockchain technology. That was the, the rest of the question. So I, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I, I think, that, you know, it's, it's, a, it's I think it's a, a kind of a reference to, um, to sort of, well, I don't know, actually. Maybe the, the person who asked the question could ask a, can ask a follow up, make certain that we got the thing that we had. But you just, you said something really interesting about I, th this question. I was interested in your answer to this question for a bunch of reasons, but you gave a, um, a, uh, an answer that made me think about something else. So if we're going to be decentralized in our use of technology, right? Um, you know, you don't know how many computers you're using, aren't worrying about physical infrastructure. Is this going to be true for people? Um, post pandemic, are we still going to be doing blue jeans and Zoom and we're going to stop being physically located or are we going to co located or do we really need to? most of the time be in the same place at the same time? I think a lot of people will go back to being in the same place at the same time, but I do think that this kind of stuff is going to change. Like people will be much more willing to do cross-continent Zoom calls. There will be way more people that work remotely. You know, I, I think a lot of the things that we did come together for don't need to happen in the same way. And I, I do think that's going to be fundamentally different. Actually, one of the things I think that is really different and I hope never changes, is that I feel like people brought a little more of their personal lives into their work. 
we all realize that, you know what? Parents have kids. They have to sometimes pick the kids up. You know, they don't go away. And I think that uh, kind of humanizing our professional experience a bit has been a very good culture change for us. Yeah, I, I know what you mean. I, I, I remember as we started going through this, just having this realization that I work with these people who have lives. They actually have lives, like they have children or they, you know, they have parents living with them or, or whatever. And there's this whole complicated thing there. And this, there's a, it's, you know, it's nice to know. And it's nice to be for, forgiven for having a life and a family and other things that are intruding in. And, um, I've locked the door in my office. My son has already come up here at least three times trying to get in. So I, I think it's a, a useful thing to know. So we're coming to the end. Um, I have a lot of questions I, I, I still wanted to ask you, but I, I want to try to end it on something um, to kind of summarize the, the, the things that you said so far. So what is the best advice that you can give for undergrads and young alum, right? People who are where you were uh, in the early 2000s, um, maybe just about to come out or just about to make key decisions about what to do that's gonna gonna drive what they're what they're gonna what they're going to do and where they're gonna end up. What what's the thing that you can tell the people who are listening uh, to help them make whatever decisions they're gonna have to make next? It's a good question. I would say, you know, if I were to go back and give myself advice, I would tell me to overinvest in networking. Because I greatly undervalued, I think, the, just the power of having a really strong network. And you know, I wouldn't even be at Credit Karma if not for my, so my now wife was a chemical engineer at tech. And she was uh, in a sorority with, a, I can't remember, she was an industrial design major. And they were roommates. And her roommate's then boyfriend, now husband, is now Credit Karma's chief marketing officer who knew Ken, our CEO, our founder. And so I got connected through this kind of weird chain of people. And, you know, the day-to-day the -day attack is kind of, you know, you're in the same classes with a lot of the same people. You make friends kind of in your own sphere. But a lot of the connections that you need are, are far outside of that sphere, sphere. So you have to really spend time and effort to go out there and, and meet people. And it's great to get straight A's, but maybe give yourself a networking grade, a kind of a quiet networking grade on the side, because that one's important. Uh, I think that's true no matter where, where you go. I think that's exactly right. So uh, I got one more question for you in the, the minute or so that, that we have we have left, um, because it's a question that uh, I've wanted to ask you when we've talked before too. So uh, it's not really a question, it's a statement. Curious about your wallpaper. Is there a <laughs> Yeah. Well, I, I don't know. Can you see there's a sensor up there in the corner? Can you actually see that little black thing? Oh, I can point it out. Yeah. Up yeah. there? Yeah. yeah. So this was an originally, I, I early adopted into kind of VR tech. And this was going to be the VR room. Mm. Not a lot of furniture, big open space. And so I picked this crazy trippy wallpaper. And now it's the uh, COVID teleconference room. <laughs> <laughs> Feels to be like that's how life works. Well, yeah. I think we're, I think we're at the end. Um, we've got another thirty or forty seconds or so, um, and I, I just want to close by telling you how much I appreciate uh, appreciate your time. I really enjoyed this. Um, I do hope that we um, have a chance to do this again in person uh, uh, sometime in the future, and that we'll have a chance to, to have you back. Uh, thanks so much. Is there anything else you want to say before we we bring it to bring Jen back on and bring it to a close? Just that I, you know, I really enjoyed it. Thank you all for being here and for asking questions. I really appreciate it. Feel free to reach out to me if you have any more. And, you know, thanks again. This was a lot of fun.